Hey everyone, it's Area of Effect, and I've got another video, a non-build video I've wanted to do for quite some time. Uh, you guys seem to have liked the other video I did here recently, a couple weeks ago, with PvP tips and tricks, what to do and what not to do. And this is going to be the top 12, maybe with an added bonus at the end, uh, secrets that Zoss does not tell you, things the game does not have written in it, things you will not know unless you go online, do some research, or find somebody like me who's a little bit psychotic and has played this game since day one. And this is what I do. I mean, every game I've played, every RPG that I've played from, you know, uh, Morrowind, Oblivion, uh, Skyrim, Two Worlds, Dragon's Dogma, Dragon Age, Mass Effect. There's so many RPGs, even the Fable games. I, I love RPGs, but the thing I seem to do most is delve into the mechanics. I would go through and spend so much more time just leveling up my swords and gear. Um, you know, Sword of Ashes plus 82. You know, it was the 82nd upgrade I did to it. And I don't need that. I don't need that to kill this like little worm guy. I, I just, that's what's fun for me. And that's what I do. Okay. My guy's as far as I can get it. He's maxed out. Well, now let's go, let's go do the story. So I, I don't know, free roaming and character building, which is kind of what my channel was built on and why it ended up where it was out of the box builds, um, unique builds, ways to break the game, triple proc sets, like whenever you combine Elf Bane with Flame Blossom on the Magma Bane build or the um, uh, Bane Blossom build, uh, check those out on my channel. This is what I do. Now, uh, I'll be honest, Elder Scrolls uh, Online, this one, in the in the, the 10 years I've plus that I've played this, there are so many things that you just got to learn the hard way that aren't written in the settings, aren't written in the tool tips. They're not even like very easily implied sometimes. They're just nowhere, but they happen. And I get it. There's so many fundamental rules and mechanics built into the game. I mean, you'd have to have an entire section for that. And it would be so, the index would be so big. I mean, I don't know if anybody would read it anyway, <clears throat> read it anyway, but so that's what we're doing here with this video. The top 12, heck, there's probably a thousand, but the top 12 biggest secrets, the things that are the most significant that you think should be somewhere in the game, somewhere described, and they're not. And that's what I'm gonna do here is point out the things that I've learned, things you won't find anywhere on the game. You'd have to find it on the internet from somebody crazy like me who's got nothing better to do but to figure out how shit works. So here we go. So yeah, let's jump in, starting with number one, glyphs. There are things about glyphs you did not know and will probably impact your game quite significantly once you learn them. So jump back in time with me briefly two years ago when I released a build called the Alien Conqueror. Check it out, what I describe here. Let's take a look at the gear now. On the back bar, we've got a lightning staff. It's the Maelstrom's perfected lightning staff. I know the glyph damage is very high and the infused trait is up to 60%. I'll explain how. All right, so let me pause it right there for a moment. Check out the infused trait. 60% is what it says there. Usually it's 30%. It says 60%. And the shot glyph on that weapon was 7,600. Okay, that's extremely high. I'll explain later in the uh, video when we return back to it how I get there. But what you need to know first is that glyphs on weapons have cooldowns. And different types of glyphs have different types of cooldowns. What a cooldown means is how often this thing will fire off. If you have a flame glyph on a weapon, you hit them with that weapon and the flame glyph applies. But it will not apply again for five seconds on any type of standard weapon. You have a weapon that's precise for crit. You have a weapon that's sharpened for penetration. The cooldown is not being altered by any way, by any kind of set or buff. Then you have to wait five seconds for that to fire off again. Even if you hit them numerous times in that time frame, you'll still wait five seconds. It will not fire off on any other of the strikes. This applies to all types of elemental damage glyphs. When it comes down to fire, um, shock, frost, magic damage, physical damage, diseased, poison, these types of glyphs have a five second cooldown at base. 
There are other glyphs like the Berserker glyph, the weapon and spell damage, the Power glyph, 348 when it's gold for a truly superb weapon and spell damage for five seconds, or the Crusher glyphs that basically reduce resistances of the enemy for five seconds. Those have a 10 second cooldown. So when you proc them, you'll have the benefit for five seconds, then it falls off, you have to wait five seconds to be able to even reapply it. So it's five on, five off, 10 second cooldown. So check this out, this is where it gets interesting. So you're not stuck with those cooldowns though. There are sets like Torg's Pact, uh, a five piece craftable set, and there are traits on weapons called Infused that will alter not only the potency of the glyph, but reduce the cooldown. There are other sets as well, like Heartland's Conqueror, where the fifth trait of that set is to modify weapon uh, traits, the sharpened, the precise, including the infused, increasing your infused trait even further, which is why I had 60% in the beginning of the clip that I paused for this build I'm showing you. But you can reduce the cooldowns and increase the potencies. And this is where stuff gets really cool. So focusing on the cooldowns for a moment, not, not just the potency, the cooldown, the infused trait on any weapon reduces the cooldown of the glyph fire off by 50%. So if we have a flame glyph or a shock glyph that applies every five seconds, now the shock glyph is gonna apply every two and a half seconds, okay? Because we've reduced the cooldown in half. It's also gonna fire off stronger, but we'll get to that in a minute. Then if you use a set a five-piece set like Torg's Pact, it decreases the cooldown by 33 more percent. So one-third of 2.5, what is that? Like 0.8, so then you take that off of 2.5, you're at 1.7 seconds. Your glyph will now be a lot bigger and fire off every 1.7 seconds. That's how fast and how often. But things get even crazier with glyphs when it comes down to bar swapping, a glyph on your back bar and a glyph on your front bar and how to use both simultaneously. So if you're running a two bar setup, let's say destruction staff and destruction staff, and on the back bar, you lay a blockade and that blockade um, is on the ground and it stays there even after you bar swap and on the weapon of the blockade is a flame glyph. Well, then your flame glyph is going to apply even if you bar swap to your other bar and your blockade weapon is swapped off. Okay, your glyph is still going to apply and apply and apply, even though you're not on that bar casting that weapon anymore. Well, at the same time that that glyph is applying in the background, you now have your other weapon bar that you are on that you could cast skills from and the glyph on that one will now apply as well two glyphs simultaneously okay but you cannot have and this is also something not written anywhere you cannot have two glyphs of the same type firing off simultaneously one from the back bar one from the front bar you can't have two shot glyphs and you know one shot glyph will fire off it's on cooldown you switch bars the other shot glyph will fire off no if you have a shock glyph on cooldown it doesn't matter if you swap bars the shock glyph on the other bar if you're doubled up, will not proc until the first one's cooldown. So it's important to have glyphs of a different type. Let's jump back into the video here. If you don't have the Maelstrom Lightning Staff, you can go with a Torg's Pact Lightning Staff, which is our first five-piece set, Torg's Pact. On the front bar, the Inferno Staff of Torg's Pact, with a Magic Damage and Magic of Restore Glyph. Look at the penetration, 6,500. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, two, three, four trait, you know, are not bad. Let's read the fifth. Decrease weapon enchantment cooldown by 33% and oblivion damage weapon enchantment potency, non-oblivion, sorry, by 45%. So more damage from your glyph and a quicker rate of fire off. Next five piece set, Heartland's Conqueror. It's a craftable set. Weapon damage, spell damage, max magicka, max stamina, increases the effectiveness of your weapon traits by 100%. So sharpened trait on a weapon will go to double, so will defending and precise, and infused will also go up from 30 to 60%, um, which is how we're getting so much penetration there from the Inferno Staff and 60% from the back bar Lightning Staff from the infused trait. Um, so with Torg's Pact and Heartland's 
and infused, you're triple dipping into your glyph power. And there's a way to even go further into that dip, which is why I was able to put on the Maelstrom's Perfected Lightning Staff on one bar and Torx Pact on the other bar, because when you lay your blockade with the Maelstrom's Perfected Lightning Staff, the glyph on the blockade will fire off as if Torx Pact is active, even though it's not, when you switch to your Inferno Staff because Torx Pact becomes active. Taking it a step further even, we have the sharpened trait on the Inferno Staff bar. So the glyph from the back bar and everything else fires off at the higher rate, but also with the bigger penetration. Okay, let's pause and talk about something real quick. Did you hear what I just said? On the back bar, the Lightning Staff, the blockade from the Maelstrom Lightning Staff, and that shock glyph on that weapon, when I lay that blockade and switch to the Torx Pact Inferno Staff bar, now and only now did the Torx Pact fifth trait become active. But it is irrelevant. The game treats it the shock glyph on the back bar on that blockade I already laid. And I laid it when Torx Pact was off, by the way. Then I swapped to the Torx Pact bar. And now I've got the increased potency and the reduced cooldown. That is now applying to the shock glyph on the Maelstrom back bar. A blockade I applied on the floor before Torx Pact was even active. So it carries over. And that's a whole nother topic, by the way, that I was gonna talk about in this video. I get asked a lot of questions. I see a lot of questions, not just about glyphs, but about carryover, the stats, how things scale when you swap, when things are casted at say a certain value and then you swap what happens i've got the answer to that as well and it's nowhere in the game we're going to get to that in a different portion but isn't that crazy i'm going to stop here and uh, get back to this clip where i'll show you a real example of how this actually works so that might be a bit confusing so i put together a clip to demonstrate what exactly i mean so my lightning blockade is down you see the 12,000, now the 7400 the 12,000 number i'm on my inferno stack let me do it again Lightning blockade swap, and you'll see the glyph number 7830, and then the 7830, 12,684. That was the glyph. It's firing off with the penetration of my Inferno Staff of Torx Pack, but it's the lightning glyph from the back bar. Now, I also have a glyph on the Inferno Staff itself with the sharpened trait. Remember, the Magicka glyph deals Magicka and restores Magicka. It's also going to fire off while right there, 3581, and restores 513. It's gonna fire off while the lightning one's firing off as well, so you're getting two glyphs firing simultaneously. You wanna go further, you lose your penetration, but take an infused trait uh, Inferno Staff, and now you've got it infused on both bars, lay the blockade, and then you look at all the numbers that the glyphs are gonna be double firing with a higher potency, a smaller cooldown, both from Torx Pact and Infused, and the potency from Torx Pact and Heartland. Um, and that one there, look, it restores even more Magicka to you. And there's also a Magic Damage and Restore Health. I think I have one here. Well, there's a Shock one again. Well, I can do, but you can't double dip into Shock. You can't have a Shock on the back bar and a Shock on the front bar, and it will double dip, by the way. It's one thing that breaks this build. The whole point is to double dip. So if you have a frost glyph on the back bar and a frost glyph on the front bar, it will not work. You cannot double proc the same glyph. They are on the same cooldown. So we'll end that there, but um, moving on, this brings me to the next topic of bar swapping and carryover. Um, how certain things that you do on one bar and when you swap over and your numbers change, how it affects what you already did. For example, a damage over time like say, um, destructive touch on the destruction staff skill line it's a damage over time say you cast it and then you swap bars um to a much lower powered defensive sword and board bar and your numbers went down your spell damage went down your max magic went down your penetration went down your crit chance went down well then your damage with destructive touch is going to go down kind of like live streaming um the feedback is pretty much on par with what your stats are in a particular window. So like 
And that's not how everything works, so it does get tricky, and I'll break down the exceptions, but for the most part, whenever you do something with um, that's a damage over time or a long-term effect, it could be an AOE on the ground, it could be a dot on somebody's body, um, when you change your stats from whether it's you uh, got a buff from an ally or you switched bars and you got a proc that buffed your weapon and spell damage or something, that immediately is going to affect everything that's already there on the ground, laid on you. It affects it like live stream with you. There are a few exceptions to this, for example, like damage shields, because they're kind of, I mean, they last for a time duration, but they're kind of a one and done. Um, you know, you cast it and then that's the value. So if you had a big max health uh, sword and board bar, like for example, on an arcanist and you cast that ultimate gibbering shelter um, and your numbers were reading really high on the sword and board bar and then you casted that ultimate, you casted that shield and then you swapped to your uh, destruction staff bar where like maybe your, your health went down for you know certain passives that weren't there or something your shield is not going to go down to the value of what your, you know, um, new stats reflect. It's shields are kind of like, what do you have right now? Okay, bang, we'll put that out there. And that's what it is. But everything else pretty much telegraphs exactly what your stats are second by second with you in real time. And that brings me to the next topic, stat screen and knowing how to read it. There are actually some goofy things about it. So, um, for example, your recoveries, when you look at your stat screen, take a look at this one as an example, you see the recovery numbers. It says stam recovery 3,373. What does that mean? Well, what that means is you'll get that exact value of stamina every two seconds. Same thing with the Magicka and same thing with the health recoveries. Those recoveries are values, exact values that you'll get every two seconds something else see the resistances 32,000 and 31,000 something else that's not necessarily explained is that 33,000 resistance is kind of your 50% cap 50% cap what does that mean when you take damage while not blocking or doing anything else just standing there at 33,000 physical and spell resistance you will take 50% of whatever damage is dealt to you. So if you got hit with a 10,000 uh, damage Dawnbreaker and you had 33,000 physical and spell resistance on the dot, then that 10,000 Dawny turns into a 5,000. Now you can go above that to 40,000 resistance, but you don't get more than 50% damage mitigation. People do this in PvP sometimes, go up to 40 or higher because there is the ability to be fractured and breached and have things debuff you, reduce your resistances down. So if you were at 33,000 and you thought you were fine, then you get hit by a bunch of things. Like for example, the Warden's Shulks, that reduces you right there by 9,000. It was with one set of Shulks flying out, major and minor breach. Now you're 9,000 less. You're sitting there at 24,000. So you're taking more than 50% of that damage. So yeah, basically in PvP, you can afford to go above that threshold because of reductions, but PvE is a little more cut and dry. Now, on the other side of resistances, let's talk about penetration. So again, it's a little more complicated in PvP because of the varying resistances of different enemies and how damage is factored in to each individual person is going to be unique. But in PvE, it's pretty much 9,000 for trash mobs and 18,000 for dungeon bosses and such. Meaning that if you had 18,000 penetration hitting somebody with 18,000 resistances, then you are carving through 100% of their resistances and hitting them with 100% of the value of your damage output. Unless they had some sort of other damage modifier like a buff such as Major Protection, which gives them 10% damage mitigation, which that opens up our next chapter, buffs and how they work named and unique most buffs come with major and minor forms and they can stack on top of each other just like the shulks i showed earlier you can inflict the enemy with major breach and 
minor breach, and they stack together, reducing the 6,000 of major and the 3,000 of minor adds up to 9,000 total, and they get them both. But there are also unique types of debuffs and buffs that are just in and of themselves completely unique, where they can stack on top of a major or a minor type of named buff. I'll show you an example. The Ember Shield set. When you deal a heavy attack, you gain 3,300 physical and spell resistance. It does not say when you deal a heavy attack, you gain major resolve or minor resolve, increasing your physical and spell resistance by the named major or minor buffs. It has a unique 3,300 value that can stack with named buffs or other unique buffs. But a big takeaway here is that you cannot stack two of the same name type of buffs, even if they are from different sources. Check this out. So here are two different ways to get a buff called Major Courage, increasing your weapon and spell damage by 430. I'm not going to read all the details of the set, but you see the Major Courage coming from Sea Serpent's Coil is a mythic item, a one piece, and the Major Courage coming from Spell Power Cure is from a five piece set. If you have Major Courage from your own Sea Serpent's Coil and you're running with an ally or a teammate that has Spell Power Cure and they're healing and they buff you with Major Courage, you're not going to get 430 plus 430. You already have one set of Major Courage, you cannot have two. However, there is a set called Powerful Assault, which gives a unique 307 weapon and spell damage. And this, since it's not named Major or Minor, Courage, or Major Sorcery, or Brutality, which is a weapon and spell damage buff, or anything named, you can stack that with a named buff and get the benefits of both. I actually did this on a stamina healer years ago called the Stam Power Cure. It's a really cool build on my channel. Go check it out. Another quick little ad that you might not be aware of and I actually talked about briefly in the PvP tips and tricks video is the cost of dodge roll being exp exponential. Each time you dodge roll consecutively within four seconds while you're still under dodge roll fatigue, they call it, the cost goes up 33% each time. So I did three rolls right there, as you can see. I advise against that, but I did make it out alive and get a kill outnumbered. But the other thing the game doesn't tell you is shield stacking order. And this is one I'm a big fan of, actually. I love shield stacking, but understanding how and what happens is important because not all shields are the same and not all do the same thing while they're active. Simply put, the first shield you cast is going to stay the outermost shield and the first one that takes damage. If you stack four shields, four different shields, in order one, two, three, four, after you completely cast the fourth one, the first one is still the outermost shield. And that's important to know if you're going to be relying on a healing ward or a ward like spiked bone shield that deals damage while you have it on you. You could cover it up with other shields and it will deal damage longer. I do have several shield stacking healers and shield stacking builds. This is one of them, Wards of the Dragon. It's a DK healer. It's amazing. I love this build. Uh, also, check out Son of Dagon. Uh, check out Engine Centurion on my channel, and I've also got a new one coming up soon. I'll uh, keep it uh, keep a lid on it, but with the patch changes coming, just keep your eyes open. Um, but yeah, check this out. This is something else I wanted to talk about is how to read tooltips and numbers. Do you see the green numbers on the allies, uh, the white numbers on the enemies? Green numbers in parentheses mean that they are taking damage but not actually taking it because the shield is keeping them from taking the damage. The shield is mitigating those numbers. If you see green numbers without parentheses, that means I'm healing my allies for those values. Now, there's numbers on enemies, white above the head, that's, that's direct damage, okay? Orange at the waist, that's damage over time. Yellow above the head with an exclamation point means critical hit on direct damage. On the damage over time, orange numbers at the waist, that actually 
even the critical ones will still be orange. But these are all things you need to know. Blocking means you have an asterisk. When you see a number with an asterisk next to it, it means it was blocked. So yeah, another thing the game doesn't actually tell you, but it's important to know what you're looking at um, when you see numbers on the enemy or yourself. Something else very important is off balance. What this means, what this does. A lot of the heavy attack builds out there utilize this. They have to because that's where they get most of their damage other than empowered. But off balance, when the enemy is off balance, they take 70% more damage from heavy attacks. They will be off balance for seven seconds. Once off balance starts, the cooldown is 22 seconds. So it'll be up for seven and then down for 15. They're on immunity. Then you can trigger it again at the 22 second mark and knock them off balance again for seven seconds. Why doesn't the game tell you this? I don't know. But speaking of immunity and something we talked about as well on the PvP tips and trick video, CC immunity. Check out the stuns and immobilizations that I am throwing on this enemy. His name's Numi. He's actually a very good player and a uh, friend of mine. Um, check it out. Immobilize, which has a four second cooldown. Stun has a seven second cooldown. He just came off immobilized, then stun. Now he's immobilized again. So he'll have a four second cooldown. You'll be able to see immobilized again right here. This Santa Claus build has so much CC stun. There he's stunned now. And just back and forth, seven seconds for stun, four seconds for immobilize, not counting snares, um, which reduce the speed of the enemy. But there is no cooldown for that. You can have somebody perpetually snared. Look, immobilized and stunned. Uh, now we're going to finish this fight here. Uh, so much ice field on the ground. So much snaring, stunning, and immobilization. Um, and then watch. You'll see a double stun and immobilize. And he is dead. And so, yeah. Why doesn't it tell you about the cooldowns uh, in the game? So definitely something I wanted to point out in this video. And another big topic especially coming next patch is status effects and i thought about doing this bit earlier in the video when we talked about glyphs because that's one of the primary ways uh the most efficient ways to proc status effects and what debuffs go with them but next patch is going to be very strong people are calling the next patch the status effect meta it's getting a rework so it's something very important to understand fundamentally how they work so let's talk about them fire this will basically result in a dot, a damage over time where they burn for four seconds. Lightning gives them concussed, which is basically minor vulnerability for four seconds, increasing their damage taken by 5%. Frost gives them minor maim, also applies minor brittle. Minor maim gives them 5% damage reduction to the damage they deal. Diseased gives them the diseased status effect, applies minor defile, reducing healing taken and health recovery. Poison is poisoned, which is basically an execute skill now. Four seconds of a damage over time that gets more powerful the lower health. Physical is sundered, which is going to basically give you weapon and spell damage 100. Magic, overcharge, which is magic of steel, which is going to give you magic of back. And lastly, a big one, bleed, gives them the hemorrhaging status effect. They bleed over four seconds. This can stack up to three times. A lot of new bleed sources next patch. But check this out. These are the ways in which you can actually apply status effects. Um, weapon enchantments have a 20% chance. This is written nowhere in the game. 20% chance if you have a fire glyph on your weapon, it's one in five going to cause them to burn. It's not just going to uh, just deal fire damage and that's it. It's going to deal fire damage and then they'll get the burning status effect. And this is where the charge trait comes into play. It used to be close to 400%, which meant 400% of 20 so 400% of 20 is basically 80%. You'd get like a four out of five chance to apply a status effect in the game. Well, they've redone the charged value now. It's now 235%, so they've reduced it somewhat because the status effects have been adjusted to be much more powerful. But the charge trait increases your chance for all of these status effects to basically improve. The single target direct damage 10%, factor 235% of that. That'd be like 23%. The area of effect direct damage, 5%. Well, what's 235% of that? That's like uh, 12, 12.3. 12 so that's so on and so forth. That's what charged means. 
But these are the values on how to proc certain status effects. But that's at base. You take in the charge trait, you take in some of the destruction staff passives or a warden's, you know, likeliness to apply chilled and those types of status effects, and you've got modified numbers. The last topic is how critical damage versus critical chance work and how to increase and decrease it and where you start. Everybody starts at base without any extra sets or buffs, 50% more damage on a critical hit. That's what everybody gets. But you could take it further with sets like Archer's Mine, increase your critical damage done by 5% at all times and 10% while in sneak. But this is only when dealing a critical strike and your critical strike chance can be displayed on your stat screen. It could be anywhere from 15% to 100 if you build it right. There are skills, sets, and all kinds of things that can, and racial passives even, that can build up your crit chance. But when you deal a critical hit, it will always at base be 50% of your standard damage, 50% more, I'm sorry, than your standard damage. Meaning, if you are going to deal a standard 10,000 damage attack, but you got a critical hit, it would be 15,000 because it's an additional 50%. But the base 50% modifier can go up with some of the other things I'm showing you now, like this five piece set, Archer's Mind, for example, increases the critical damage done by 5% and, and critical damage done by an additional 10% when attacking from sneaker invisibility. If you're sneaking, that's 60% damage. If you're also a Khajiit, look at the bottom one, increase critical hit damage and healing by 12%. So say you're wearing Archer's Mind and a Khajiit, that's 60 plus 12, that's 72% now. So now as a Khajiit wearing Archer's Mind, you've got 72% critical damage, not chance, damage. But we could take it even further. Look at this. Now let's throw this combo on a Night Blade. Increase your damage dealt on the bottom by critical damage done by 10%. So our 72 goes to 82% critical damage. But this also gives us weapon, weapon critical strike rating. That 1320 is basically 6%. When you see a 1320, it's 6%. When you see a 600 value, it's 3%. Um, but we can go even further. Channeled acceleration gives you minor force, increasing your critical damage done by 10%. So now we've got a buff. That 82 becomes 92% on that Khajiit um, Nightblade wearing Archer's Mind and using the channeled acceleration uh, skill. 92% crit damage up from 50 and what does that mean if you hit them with a 10,000 point blow and you got a crit hit instead of being 15,000 it'll be 19,200 damage that critical strike well that's going to wrap up this video i doubt that i covered everything they don't tell you because zoss is a bunch of sneaky slimy slithery plebeians so if any of you can think of anything that's big that i did not mention go ahead and throw it in the comments also, the bonus that I talked about earlier, stop paying money to the way shrine gods. Stop traveling at the expense of your own gold. Pull up a friend, pull up somebody you know, just, it doesn't matter where they are, just pull them up, travel to them, you'll unlock the closest way shrine to them, or if you have it already unlocked, you'll travel to it. But anyway, then once you get there, you're at a way shrine. Travel from that way shrine to the one you actually want to go to. You're welcome. I just saved you millions. You just became a millionaire. But all right, guys, that's a wrap. If you like this video and you want to see more, head on over to my channel. I've got plenty of content on there, including builds. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and uh, let me know what you thought. Thanks for watching. Area of Effect, signing out.